I'm Steve Backshaw, and you're listening to the Aussie Wildlife Show. All right, guys, welcome to the Aussie Wildlife Show. Adrian here, and I'm here, of course, with Steve. Good night, guys. And we are very lucky today to have with us Mr. John Fowler. John, hey, mate. Hi, everyone. A uh, good friend of ours and also a reptile enthusiast, a bit like us. Yep. John, um, I've been into reptiles for a long time, mate, and uh, back when the internet first started, you would, you would Google different you know, reptiles that you may not get to see in the wild very often, looking for images of these reptiles. And most of the time, some of these obscure reptiles back in the day, they'd come up and they'd have the name Fowler on them, and they were your images. That's right. So in the early days, I was one of the biggest, had one of the biggest sites, uh, Australian sites on reptiles. So um, it was one of the few places you could actually get any photos or reliable information. What drives you to, to, to put together this internet database of the reptile fauna of Australia? Well, I started up with another site called AustralianHerptology.com and some guy in America contacted me and he said, why don't you make a site listing every species of reptile in Australia and uh, I said well that's way way too much there's too many species and he said I'll, I'll help you he said I'll scan all of your slides because this was pre-digital camera days uh, if you send them across to me and I will make up the maps for you that he'll get out of books he said he'd get them out of books so I got together 450 slides each one of different species and sent them across to America. He's in Texas. And I sent him the lists of the Australian reptiles too. So he put those into uh, basic web pages. It was a nightmare for him. It took him forever. He was scanning the slides individually. And um, we ended up with a site that was barely usable, very basic, all hand-coded. So there was no way of, uh, no automatic uh, Dreamweaver or uh, what's the other one people use these days? Squarespace or... Oh, yeah, none of those were around then. You had to do it by hand. He did that for a while, and then after a few years, he decided he couldn't handle it anymore. It was just way too much work for him. So he said, yeah, you just look after it by yourself. So that's what I did. So I have basically got into that, and I do a lot of reptile photography, so it's a good place for me to showcase my reptiles. And now, of course, I have multiple... With the ones I have photos of, I have multiple photos of a lot of the more common sort of species rather than just having one picture like a lot of sites. So reptilesofaustralia.com? Reptilesofaustralia.com is the one that was made specifically to list all of the Australian reptile species and it's continually growing. There's new species being described every few months, new photos becoming available, new information and names changing and whatever. So it's constant updating needed to keep it up to date. Are you managing to keep up with the uh, name changes? Uh, the name changes are actually quite hard because no one sort of notifies me that the names have changed. The uh, sort of uh, scientists in the univers- in the museums and whatever, they know quite often when the names change, but uh, I have to sort of learn off the grapevine. So uh, sometimes it can take quite a while, and some of these changes a lot of people don't ever don't hear about for years and until after they've been changed. So, for example, the uh, the mud snakes, which are the rear fanged aquatic snakes that are found in estuaries in Australia, they used to be classed as colubrids. A lot of people don't realise they've actually been taken out of the colubrids and they've got their own family now. That sort of went under the radar for most people for quite a long while, including myself. I can't believe they don't call you up and let you know when there's been a name change. No. And in the early days of internet, people would contact me if there was a spelling error on one of my pages or something like that <laughs> these days people don't care they just go somewhere else you know because there's a a ton of reptile sites out there there's very few that have complete lists of every australian species on there so uh the other one it, the other good one which is better than mine is arid and he's got photos of almost every species of reptile um but um, other than that, uh, the other one, the Atlas of Living Australia, there's another uh, one, but that's very unreliable. The distribution maps are put in by members of the public. I that's mean, right. I think that lists saltwater crocodiles in Tasmania. Yeah, and black-headed pythons will turn up in Melbourne and Perth <laughs> and places like that. But also people, because it's not only museums, it's like people that do surveys, they quite often misidentify stuff. 
And uh, so they'll misidentify perhaps a little whip snake as a spectacled snake and vice versa, or a uh, alpine water skink as a common water skink, all sorts of things like that. And if you in their photos, quite often they're either museum specimens like pickled, or um, you might get uh, the species might be jackalers and you might have a picture of a bearded dragon or vice versa. So there's amateurs supplying the pictures quite often, and then no one seems to be checking those. It's good as a reference, but you've got to be aware that there's a lot of misleading stuff on there as well. Yeah, and it'd be hard for the average punter yeah. to discern what's real and yes, what's not. Yes, that's right. So, so with reptiles of Australia, that's an ongoing thing? You, you'll yeah. always be doing that, I guess? That's right. I work on that. I'm travelling all the time now, pretty well all the time, so I take my computer with me and I take a, a second screen, because Dreamweaver, which is what I use, is a dual screen program, or it works best in dual screen, and I will update it as I go. So... When new species come out, I try and work on those straight away as soon as I found, find out about it. When they describe the new species, um, quite often there's very little information, quite often no photos, or it's very hard to get photos uh, at all. Um, so it is definitely an ongoing task, and I knew that from day one that it would be like that. But I say I've been doing it probably since, I don't know, when in, before internet, almost before internet was available to the general public. So it was dial up days. And before the average person having internet access was normal. Mm. Yeah. And digital cameras have come into it as well, so it's probably a little bit easier for you. <laughs> yeah, although my first digital camera, uh, I used to work for a, a computer company uh, at the time which uh, wholesaled um, cameras, and my first one that I borrowed from work was one megapixel. <laughs> and uh, in fact, my pictures of, uh, of ring tailed geckos. There might still be some on there that were taken with a one megapixel camera. They were really pathetic quality photos with digital cameras So in those days, yeah. Now, of course, you know, your iPhone takes uh, pretty well pictures that are comparable with a SLR. Mm -hmm. I'm usually using an iPhone to take my pictures these days. Did you supply all the photos for the website? Um, I Initially, when we built it, I supplied all the photos. And then I went through a phase of asking a lot of people for photos but as time's gone on i've noticed that most things that are hard to get photos of people don't know they exist or they're not interested in them what they're interested in mainly is the things they see on day-to-day -day basis or uh, like for example lace monitors and and uh, different types of pythons and uh, a lot of the more dangerous snakes and uh, things that they that they want identified or they're interested. That's what they're searching for. They're not searching for some obscure gecko that's only found in some mountain in the middle of Western Australia. Um, but occasionally people will offer me photos um, and uh, occasionally I'll see a picture that I think, oh, that would look really good, you know, on my website and I'll ask. But I've really got, I'm taking so many photos that I've really got plenty of my own ones to play with and plenty of errors on the pages. So in the early days, there was no spell check. Um, and then there's been complications like um, the code changing, you know, different versions. And, of course, now everything has to work on phones. So in the early days, people just used normal monitors. But now you have to make your pages work with mobile uh, app, uh, phones. So, yeah, so that's... I just spent a lot of time tidying stuff up and making it look correct. Yeah, it's a, lab a labour of love, and obviously it, it is a labour of love. But you don't monetise the site at all. Uh, I do monetise it, but it's virtually negligible <laughs> money. <laughs> uh, when I first got into internet, because I used to be a computer engineer, I'd actually had uh, expected I could make a lot of money out of it, but I've, I'm definitely running at a loss. <laughs> <laughs> Pays for your fuel. You no, it doesn't do. Oh. It doesn't pay for the fuel. <laughs> you definitely can't charge your time down to it. <laughs> it doesn't pay for anything. <laughs> has the pursuit for getting photos of obscure reptiles taken you to some unique places? And have you? What's made you really? What was an animal you, you've managed to capture that's really excited you, John? Um, well, there's been quite a lot, but I even get. I like to see any animals, and it's nice if you see. Uh, really nice looking animals or get really nice photos so even sometimes some of the common things I'm still taking pictures of shinglebacks and I must have seen I mean shinglebacks in South Australia are extremely common but I'm still taking pictures of shinglebacks and uh, uh, I just was looking at them the other day I was going to post a few more up there uh, the other day because they vary from area to area so 
um, you know, if you travel a few hundred miles, normally you're looking at different colour phases of shinglebacks and different patterns, and even within one area, they vary quite a lot. So, um, yeah, so I like to have a variety of animals and colour phases and things like that. Um, I do, there are sometimes some animals that are obscure that I particularly get excited about if I find them. Um, but these days, because a lot of my original pictures are old, uh, even some of the common things that I just don't have photos of, um, you know, I can get excited even about common things, even little skinks sometimes. These days, if it's some, something I haven't got, you know, I will spend extra time just on some little drop tail thing. <laughs> yeah, it's good for you. That's awesome. I think it's harder to get people interested in small skinks than it is to get them interested in plants. Yeah, that's really good. 110 years you've been doing it and you're still yeah. excited about <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> so the internet was a great tool for you to meet herpers all over the globe and for them to be exposed to you and some of our reptiles. It's changed keeping reptiles. People can now network on Facebook and things like that rather than having to get the trading post. Well, when I started, there was no trading post. <laughs> <laughs> I used to go to a place called Pet Centre, which was in the middle of Adelaide. And um, you could buy carpet snakes there. They used to cost a dollar a foot. <laughs> uh, green tree snakes were, were $4 each, and uh, freshwater snakes uh, were a similar sort of price. I think I paid $8 for my first black-headed python. And, um, that must have been long. <laughs> <laughs> but um, they weren't protected in those days, by the way. So uh, people used to come in from interstate with bags full of snakes. And green tree snakes, for example, would be piled up in the, on display. So there were quite a lot of them <laughs> for sale. They were one of the more popular things because they were uh, not so uh, dangerous looking as carpet snakes. Yeah. So they were a very popular thing in their day. And of course now they're, they're very highly prized. But uh, you used to get weird things coming in too. So I got, I can remember getting things like an ornamental snake, uh, a uh, one of the black whip snakes. I'm not sure which type because they've been split up since then. Um, I got a um, Varanus. Well, it hasn't. It's not a valid name, but Varanus peloensis. So even though it's not a valid name, most people would know what that is. But at the time, I didn't have any idea what it was, and I took it to the museum, and they didn't know what it was. But um, yeah, you never knew what you were going to see in there because, as I say, there was no protection, thing, anything would come in. The pet centre used to be run by the McKechnie family and um, they uh, set up the Gould Wildlife Park. So if you're in Adelaide, you'd know the Gould Wildlife Park. And Bob McKechnie uh, was the guy that uh, set that up and I became quite friendly with him. I was one of the best customers for their pet shop for a start. Um, and uh, I even worked for them uh, doing displays at uh, shopping centres. So I'd go in when I was a teenager. I was, uh, was only like about 17. I'd go into their pet shop, pick up a load of animals, which would might include a uh, uh, let's think a, a donkey, <laughs> a monkey, a koala, all sorts of creatures like that. And then I would um, I had a trailer, so it was like a utility and a trailer. And then I'd take them to one of the uh, big shopping centres and uh, so give you, you used to take you used to take donkeys. I had one monkeys. donkey, <laughs> and I didn't always have the donkey. It would vary from. Wow. I did it for, a, I think, for a couple of years. Um, and of course, and Bob McKechnie, um, he was really good, um, and uh, he used to give me animals too. So uh, he gave me a. Uh, uh, Whistling kite, which uh, I kept, you know, which in those days we used to call them whistling eagles more, but now they tend to call them whistling kites, I think. Um, and uh, he gave me a fox that someone had brought in. Um, oh, I'll release that straight away. Get no, it. I had it as a pet, I think, <laughs> but I swapped it for something. I can't remember what I swapped. I swapped it with a neighbour, believe it or not. I can't think. I can't remember what I swapped it with, but she had some kind of animal I wanted. And I, I, the fox wasn't actually a very good pet. It was uh, <laughs> quite jumpy and smelly <laughs> very smelly <laughs> wow so you've had some pretty cool animals um yes and in and i actually kept a lot of uh, mammals and a lot of native fish um but i don't keep any of that type of stuff anymore so i've kept uh things like wallabies and uh a couple of species of wallabies and um uh ring tails and brush tail possums and sugar gliders and then a whole stack of native rats so uh, three species of hopping mice, which are the Natomas, and a lot of people would be familiar with Natomas alexis. 
Um, so I kept three species of those. What I were kept, the other two? One would have been Mitchell's. Oh, uh, yeah, I had Mitchell's and I had Sabinus. Uh, I'm not sure which one it was, the other one, Fuscus, and one of the, the other ones anyway. I only had one of them that somehow got to me. And uh, marsupial mice had um, uh, mar- uh, some marsupial rats as well. And uh, also uh, all different types of native rats too. So include one of my uh, favourites was a giant white tail rat that I had. And uh, they're massive. They are massive. They're, they're the, and uh, they're almost like uh, cat size. And um, when I got it, uh, I picked it up from a research place. So I used to trade a lot with uh, in those days with uh, universities and uh, uh, people that were studying various people that were studying native animals and uh, when I picked up this giant white-tailed rat I was told that um, you had to get them pretty well very young otherwise you couldn't get them tame and uh, I picked it up and I had um, a teenage girl in the back that held it all the way home and the whole time it was hold it sucking on her finger right the whole way home and then when I was keeping it at home. Every time I would pick up this rat, it would suck on my finger, even when it was fully grown and could have probably taken the end of my finger off. But it was tame. It was a beautiful animal and um, very large. Um, Ended up, when I tried to breed it, though, I borrowed another one off of a friend and uh, uh, it um, killed mine. (laughs) So, uh, yeah, it... it, uh, they they got on reasonably well, but one day I just no, found mine dead. And it, <laughs> no, they didn't. <laughs> well, they did until one day <laughs> when obviously I had some kind of a squabble. And this thing, it, initially I I didn't know why it died, but it had, had a mark in the back of its neck. So I think everyone had grabbed it on its neck and bitten right into it and just killed it. So, ah. yeah, so it might have been an unusual thing. But that was a, a, a bit of a sad one to lose. I've always wanted ga- uh, Gambian pouch rats, so... <laughs> That sounds perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, I had uh, things like uh, pl- Rattus bolosismus, which is a plague rat. I had uh, Pseudomys nanus, which is, I don't remember what they, what they call those, but I had a whole range of them, Gray's rat, mosaic tailed rats, a whole stack of them. And uh, most of them bred quite easy too. So I was, as I say, I'd trade with different universities around Australia in those days. And at one stage... Uh, uh, I was I supplied a ton of uh, Natomas Alexis, you know, just the common spinifex hopping mice uh, to uh, Flinders University, and a load of cages for them to do research on their uh, burrow dig- digging. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, before we had an amnesty, the reptile amnesty in Australia, did you ever have any exotic? Reptiles? Uh, in South Australia, they never had an amnesty. When they had that amnesty in New South Wales, there were people keeping stuff illegally. Mm. In South Australia, when they didn't have the amnesty. They put everything on that you had, like you were, didn't have need permits. So they weren't protected, and then they suddenly became protected. So if you had them, they automatically got on your permits. So we didn't need to have an amnesty. Mm. You just got the permits for what you had Yeah, at the time. Yeah. Before the permit system, were there more people keeping, do you think, or is it...? Uh, no, there were probably less people keeping them with bigger collections, but there still was a, a pet trade because, as I say, Pet Centre used to do sell a lot. And believe it or not, uh, when I was a teenager, um, I actually used to work at the local uh, pet shop at Marion Shopping Centre. When Marion Shopping Centre uh, was a very small shopping centre, I worked in the pet shop there on, uh, I, can't, I think it might have been Thursday nights and Saturday mornings, just specialising in selling their reptiles and giving people advice on their reptiles. And uh, and it was all wild caught in those days, though, bear in mind. No one bred barking geckos or anything like that. They were all wild caught. So what makes somebody want to work with reptiles and keep reptiles? I like to ask this question. I know a lot of people that do it. Um, it's a bit hard to explain, but um, there seems to be an awful lot of people that are pretty well fanatical about it these days. Um, you know, besides me, I'm not the only... It used to be unusual... People used to kill a lot more stuff when I was um, first starting. So people people do still kill snakes and things, but it used to be a lot more. Um, and these days people are quite happy, or a lot of people at least, are quite happy to phone up a snake catcher and get their snakes caught. And they are quite often even concerned about their black snakes or brown snakes, surprisingly. 
but when I was young, it was much worse as far as people killing stuff. And I can remember I used to do, try and do some snake catching and uh, you know, in people's gardens because it wasn't organised. But I can remember going out to someone's house looking for a brown snake, and I never charged, and I found a blue tongue that they had killed, and I was most upset about that, you know. Yeah, I, you, a lot of the older generation, they would kill even lizards, you know. They didn't, they didn't want blue tongue lizards or goannas or any kind of reptile hanging around their house. Yeah, people are much more educated these days. Yeah, people are much more conservation-minded these days too, although there still are some people that seem quite happy to destroy uh, large areas of native bushland. But, mm. Yeah. Well, I guess we're a species. We come from a long line of people that lived in the wild with things that would eat us. So we probably have this innate kind of, we don't want that hanging around us. That could become a threat. That could be dangerous. But now we have gone the other way and we've wiped out most things. And um, I think that there's generations coming up now that appreciate seeing a blue tongue lizard or a bearded dragon or having one as a pet. Mm, yeah, we were saying sure. the other day that it's really unusual that somebody keeps a pet snake. Like, yeah. Really, in the history of humanity, that's an unusual thing to do. Mm. And I have, uh, I don't know, about four or five Facebook pages as well. And I get uh, so many people signing up, like on a daily basis, I would get maybe uh, three or four a day signing up for my pages. And it's quite often women uh, that have got children uh, so I think it's sort of getting to the second generation now. And of course, uh, we didn't have, didn't use to have the type of things displays that you do. You know, the snake part, you know, reptile parties, and um, the uh, there wasn't so many shows and stuff like that. To see a decent reptile collection, I used to have to drive, go to Joe Bredel's reptile park at Renmark. So uh, that's quite a long drive to see a decent number of reptiles. Besides the one in, ones in captive collections, so I think that was, might have been why some people had big collections, because once you got interested in those days, you couldn't really go um, to many places to, to see stuff. You know, you had to really get it yourself. And that's where I got a lot of my experience, by keeping stuff myself. So in the early days, I used to... I, I went through... Because I've been keeping for so long and for so many years, kept a lot of species, a lot of stuff that isn't available now in the pet trade especially small venomous snakes so you don't get those in the pet trade at all now virtually I can't really think of any small venomous snakes that anyone keeps anymore yeah it is interesting I mean you see it with mammals too I mean there are times where people couldn't give away long nosed potter roots and now there's a lot of people I know around the country that are desperate <coughs> to get their hands on a long nosed potter root yeah and the laws in the other states used to be much more stricter than South Australia so in South Australia um, you've always been able to keep mammals but there was a big thing with the eastern states where they didn't seem to think that native mammals could be kept by private people. And uh, and they would rescue animals, quite often were destroyed in some of those states rather than let someone care for them, which is a bit sad. Um, it's still a bit like that now, isn't I it? I think that still does happen mm. in some places. Mm. OK. Yeah. We, I think we're by far the luckiest state with most species, though, aren't we? Um, well, I think uh, as far as laws go, South Australian laws are much more reasonable than a lot of the other states. Uh, there are a couple of other states not too bad, but um, in Victoria, for example, they have a list of species they're allowed to keep. You know, they don't have, like in South Australia, basically the list is almost everything, just as long as you can house it. And if it's a specialist, you have to prove that you can house it if you get hold of one. Um, but most of the other states have lists, so you know you can only keep the more common things. Like in Queensland, uh, when I was I was up in Queensland, I went to a meeting up there, and uh, they're changing the laws up there, and they were saying, "Oh, we're not going to allow anyone to keep parentis anymore." So then uh, there's people that already have parentis, but they were going to take those off. Now I don't know whether they've decided to leave those on, but um, there's the the laws as from what I could understand from the people describing it to me, uh, are not very good. Like, compared to South Australian laws, you know, they are really, I think, bad. The only thing they used to do, the uh, export permit's good, because if you've got it legally in uh, Queensland and you want to send it to South Australia, you just have to fill some paperwork and you send it. And you, in South Australia, you've got our stuff that has to go with it as well, though. But here, it's 
normally with most states, you've got to fill up paperwork at both ends, even though the animals are going from one person to another. And there should be sort of, they've always said there's supposed to be free trade between the states, so you shouldn't have to have too much, too many fees, shouldn't have any fees really. Mm. Um, and there shouldn't be this, uh, like, uh, no obstacles to go over. When you've already got the thing legally in the first place, you shouldn't have to, you know, do paperwork to transfer yeah, it to another they, state. They get around that by by calling it um, admin fees and things like that. But yeah. you're right. Yeah, it's free. It's free yeah. trade. Well, some of the Western Australian ones are very high prices to get Western mm. Australian stuff into yeah. South Australia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're, you're absolutely right. Free trade should be used yeah. in Australia. But yeah. So some of the states charge. Some South Australia doesn't normally charge mm. for those things. No. Yeah. We did a we did Steve and I did a whole episode just talking about just pros and cons of having native animals as pets. Um, what are your thoughts? Do you think it's a good thing, a bad thing, uh, important, or what are your thoughts? Um, well, I think it is a good thing. Um, you know, a lot of people keep dogs and cats, and I like dogs. And I one of the things I'm doing all the time is house sitting, which I'm looking after dogs, cats, and other animals, and Almost all of them are not native. So um, I kinda, I'm kind of trying to think. I almost looked after some native snakes, uh, but that one fell through. But it is a bit sad when you think of it that most people are keeping non-native animals when there are a lot of the native animals do actually thrive in captivity. Because I, I was one of these people that thought, I mean, I, I guess particularly mammals, I used to think that, yeah, some of these people shouldn't keep these mammals because I, maybe I just knew a lot of drop kicks at the time. But been working in the industry for a long time, I've met some fantastic keepers that really do provide the right housing, the food, they do the research. And I've been impressed by um, some of these setups that people have got. And I'm like, well, they're, they're doing the right thing by these animals. So I've changed my tune. I think, well, that's good. And that, that should be encouraged. Yeah. So the other thing is that it educates people. So people, for example, when they keep snakes, yeah, they realise that they're maybe not as bad as they... Fault. So there's, there's still people that are frightened of carpet snakes or are terrified of carpet snakes or freshwater snakes and a lot of these things and we'll quite often kill them first and worry about whether they are uh, dangerous. They're quite often they're legless lizards. So I quite often hang around one of the uh, Australian reptile identification uh, pages and uh, it's not uncommon to see a picture of a dead legless lizard on there saying, what is this? So uh, legless lizards are not normally kept in captivity, captivity as much as other reptiles. But um, even so, things like uh, carpet snakes are kept. So, uh, you know, instead of people just going out and killing a carpet snake when they see it, they can probably look at it in the wild and appreciate that it's not such a nasty animal. I, I see it every day. I, as you know, I show animals for a, uh, to people for a living and educate, and people are often breaking down those those preconceived ideas about snakes, you know, touching, feeling, seeing a snake, oh, it's not trying to kill me. Um, yeah, so I, I agree with you. I was born in uh, the UK, and uh, I, I remember my dad pointing out a, a snake to me once when I was a kid, and I remember going to a, uh, a wildlife, uh, not wildlife, an animal expo or something at, I think it was Wembley Stadium or somewhere like that, and I touched a snake for the first time, but I've never had a fear of snakes. I did used to keep... Um, Tortoises. So in, when I was a kid in UK, the Greek type tortoises were quite popular as pets. And I can remember always, whenever I went to the pet shop, I wanted to see the, the terrapins, which were, we call red eared terrapins, or we used to just call them terrapins, but they are the red eared sliders, which is now a problem in parts of Australia as an introduced mm. pest and all around the world. All really. around the world, yeah. yeah. Do we have an introduced amphibian here besides cane toads? We've had some others come in. Um, but there's, as far as I know, and I'm not a frog expert, that's the only one that is introduced. But um, we have had, and we do, of course, have the axolotl. We do. The axolotl oh. is sold in pet shops here, yeah. which is from um, Mexico, Central America, or somewhere like that. Yeah. I think, I think I it's even presumed to be extinct in the wild now, where they come from. Uh, I don't know about that, but they are definitely not native, <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, there was a stage, and you may not be aware of this, but there was a stage when there was a couple of other amphibians. Well, uh, the other one that was um, quite common at one stage, I don't know if they still have them here, and that is the clawed toad. So the clawed toad uh, used to be used uh, for medicinal 
uh, uh, well, not so much medicinal purposes, but they used to use it for pregnancy testing. Oh. Yeah, and uh, so hospitals used to have those, and I can remember a friend of mine showing me one that had come from a hospital when I was a teenager, and I don't know whether they're still around, um, but there was also these um, a stage when you could buy uh, newts and... Um, Try and think, but the other one was a salamander. So I remember keeping some European newts, which I bought from a pet shop in Melbourne, and I had some Japanese red-bellied newts, which I also bought from a pet shop in Melbourne, and they were quite readily available for quite for maybe a few years, um, and then uh, they outlawed them in South Australia. But I actually used my my newts actually bred for me. Um, but most people wouldn't be aware of those, but I haven't seen them. I don't know if there's st- any, st- any of those newts still around. There might be some somewhere in Australia. Did you have that... boa constrictors at some point? Yeah, so boa constrictors, of course, are generally not kept by private people in Australia. Um, but there was uh, a boa constrictor that some South Australians might remember. It was... Solomon. It was called Solomon, yeah, and it was kept at the Aberfoyle hub or Abfoyle Park Library for a while hmm, and I uh, it's in its 40s yeah and that one was <laughs> supposedly discovered in an amnesty but as far as I know there was never an amnesty but somehow it was it was made legal and uh, and that there may be a condition of that was that it was displayed at the library I don't know what but anyway what happened was uh, the library got some kind of a grant to rebuild the cage that they were keeping this boa constrictor in. And it was a very, very expensive cage and uh, they needed to have the boa constrictor housed temporarily for, as I say, only a short time really by someone that, that uh, you know, a private person. And uh, the person that that first got the bar constrictor was the same person that rediscovered the Adelaide Blue Tongue, which was Graham Armstrong. And uh, Graham Armstrong as a, uh, was a long-term friend of mine and he had been on lots of herp group trips and his brother worked in national parks and stuff like that. You're talking and about the pygmy blue tongue, yeah? The pygmy blue tongue, yeah, which was thought to be extinct by most people. Yep. Yeah, and he, he actually found that, just diverging a little bit, uh, he found a brown snake on the road near Burra uh, that had been run over by a car, and when he went to check it, he noticed a bit of a bulge in it, so he cut it open and found the, uh, the Adelaide blue tongue in there. So it was an unusual find. But anyway, he, uh, he was looking after this bar constrictor for a month or two and then had to go overseas for a period of time. So he applied to, I don't know what department it was, had his paperwork for the, the snake. He applied for them to alter the paperwork. So they altered the paperwork, and the snake was... I, I kept the snake... I don't know how long, it might have been six months, might have been eight months, I can't really remember, but I did have that in captivity for a while, and that was a a, uh, a lucky opportunity, but uh, it, went, it ended up going back to the uh, Aberfoyle, um, to the library, and from then it was still my responsibility to look after it, because the initial person had also gone into state or something like that, or permanently moved out of state, so uh, it was my responsibility to make sure it was cared for, but in those that at that stage, I was doing a lot of property investing, and uh, I just paid someone else to go and clean it out and feed it. Nice. Is there is there any way we can legally own an exotic reptile in this country, unless we own, besides owning a zoo? Um, it would vary from state to state, but I think that you would you might. Uh, Normally, like wildlife parks these days, seem to be able to get a lot of stuff, excess stuff from zoos. So, at some stage, they—I I don't know the exact details—but some stage they changed the laws about keeping exotic species, and they made this list of stuff you could have or you couldn't have, or just I think maybe more a list of what you could have. <laughs> and um, uh, a lot more of the uh, exotics started turning up in zoos. Um, so I can remember, for example, years ago seeing one at the Canberra Reptile Park and also at the um, Graham Gow had some in, at his wildlife park in Darwin, some boas. Um, and um, there was just a few places and 
but they just started turning up in more and more of those places and it wouldn't surprise me if in some states someone like yourself could possibly get them if you wanted to get a boa constrictor because we can have i mean anyone can get exotic mammals birds, birds amphibians fish don't know about invertebrates so i could possibly apply for an alligator uh, well, you could try. So I could say that John <laughs> sent me. Yeah, just, say, just mention my name. <laughs> I don't think they know me. Uh, I did get actually raided by Customs once and National Parks, both on the same day. Course. This is what yeah. we need. Come on, John. Here yeah. Right. So, uh, yeah, so what happened was um, when I was 17, I got a chance to work at a reptile park in Bundaberg. And uh, it was Dreamtime Reptile Park, and Pete Richardson was the guy that was running it. And he he was basically opening it up. And I went up there, uh, and I spent two months there. It, it rained almost every day, and he never made any money, so it wasn't viable for me to stay there. But I did pick up some some, some reptiles while I was up there. And in those days, they were not protected, protected in Queensland. And in South Australia, they hadn't yet protected the venomous snakes. So when I came back to Adelaide, I brought back some venomous snakes with me. Unfortunately, I had a car accident at uh, Redmark. So um, I, I had to get a tow truck out to come and get my car. And uh, I asked them if they could drop me off at Joe Brittle's house so that I could leave the reptiles that I had with him. The guy that was with the driver in the tow truck was also a writer for the local newspaper <laughs> and uh, he wrote an article about the fact that I'd brought these snakes back but he misquoted me and said that I'd brought back 150 reptiles from Queensland instead of saying I'd brought back 10 or 5 or whatever, I don't know how many it was but it wasn't a very large number uh, venomous <laughs> snakes from Queensland so I got a raid from National Parks and from Customs they both came around um, and uh, yeah, I didn't get in trouble for it, of course, because I hadn't done anything wrong. Because you'd sold the rest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't actually ever had any besides besides those all those animals. I haven't uh, kept anything illegal like they do in the eastern states. So in the eastern states, there's uh, what well, there used to be quite a big trade in exotics, uh, Queensland. New South Wales and Victoria, very big trade in exotics, illegal exotics. But their laws were also on the natives were much tougher. So in South Australia, there wasn't that demand for exotics because you could keep a lot of the native stuff legally. So, uh, yeah, so I'm not into importing. I've never imported anything. I've never smuggled anything in and I wouldn't do that. Yeah, good It's for you. crazy anyway. You, you find, besides the danger to the... You know, um, I know you don't want exotics loose in Australia. We've got enough exotics already. Mm. I absolutely mm. understand not bringing exotic animals in. Um, don't understand why we can't send out captive bred reptiles, but bringing mm. them in, I do. Yeah, if those things bred in enough numbers, I don't see why they shouldn't go out. Mm. Uh, I mean, I know sometimes the market just gets saturated here with certain animals and people just stop breeding them, you know, and... People then you can't get them here. <laughs> yeah, they need to stop breeding them because yeah, we can't export them. <laughs> and and the, what I found, like I've done a lot of travelling overseas and one thing uh, is you do get Australian stuff overseas but a lot of the things like frill necks, stuff like that, and green pythons, they don't come from Australia. Those, those things are coming from Indonesia. Yep. And it's a, it is legal for them to get them from Indonesia. Well, that's the same as the sugar gliders too. Yeah, sugar glides are extremely popular in America. So you've travelled around and you do a bit of herping when you're on the road? I try to, yeah. So I've been to quite a few countries. Um, I've been to America several times and I've been uh, to a lot of countries in Europe. I've spent, I'm not, I don't have any Greek background, but I've spent quite a bit of time in Greece and, and uh, done a lot of herping in Greece. Uh, which was very interesting because they have a lot of stuff in Greece that you would expect to find there, like, for example, boas. I wouldn't have thought there'd be any boas in Greece. They're supposed to be a New World animal. Um, and there are chameleons. 
I never found any of those species, but I was looking for them. And they have some amazing stuff, like uh, the colubrids. They, they have whip snakes, which are not poisonous, by the way. But they have a giant whip snake. And I managed to catch a baby one of those, but they supposedly grow to 10 foot long. So you're talking about a pretty amazing snake. I did find dead snakes in Greece, uh, besides job. that live one, yeah. Good job. And they have a lot of tortoises, <laughs> you know, land tortoises. So, yeah, there's lots of... Uh, and uh, they have freshwater ones. They have the Balkan terrapins and things. So there's a lot of interesting stuff, because we don't see that stuff in zoos here, you know. You're mainly seeing, uh, you know, the standards... Most zoos, actually, around the world just have standard stuff. So they have, you know, your usual alligators, yep. <laughs> uh, boa constrictors, your uh, anaconda, your king cobra. I can't think what else, but there's yeah, a little... Just, just a, the a, a Burmese everyone, pythons. Yeah, yeah, everyone the, knows. Got to have a giant yeah. snake, a king cobra. Yeah, but yeah. they're now getting into Komodos and things like that. Uh, and of course, it's, actually, it's, it's, it's a lot of zoos do have Komodos too. Now. Yeah, because yeah, they're mm. starting to breed them in numbers. Mm. Yeah. A lot of zoos are not up to my standard because, they, and even, it's not only the reptiles that are standard. It's the things like the, uh, you know, you got your giraffes, your lion, your tigers, your zebras, or elephants, things like that. So, but some zoos have some really good reptile collections. So San Diego Zoo, yeah, got a massive reptile collection. Some of the uh, the um, the one in Amsterdam, I can't remember the name of the one in Amsterdam, that has a lot of European stuff on display. And then if you go to uh, the one in Kuala Lumpur, they have a lot of South East, uh, Southeast Asian stuff on display, which is, you know, which you just don't even know exists a lot of this stuff. I remember as a kid going to Adelaide Zoo, and you probably remember this, John, they used to have the big reptile pit. Yes. The concrete pit, and you'd stand on the steps and look in, and there was a bit of a moat around the outside. Yes. And you'd spend a bit of time, and you'd spot water dragons, red-bellied black snakes, brown snakes, bearded dragons, blue tongues in this and it was fantastic and that was way better than walking through the corridor of vivariums and they the adelaide zoo believe it or not this was before protection and the adelaide zoo used to buy snakes off the general public and uh i i actually sold them uh, not many snakes but i did sell them at least one or two and they paid i think it was four dollars a snake yeah that would be say for a black snake or a brown snake or something like that i can remember uh i won't mention his name but a, a very famous South Australian herpetologist, and he was telling me that he'd caught a snake. I think it was a black snake, but I might be the wrong. Might be the wrong species. It would either be a black or a brown. And he t- he caught the bus to take it to the zoo uh, to uh, sell it, and he had it in his. I think it was a, his school bag or something like that. And uh, he, when I think he had to buy, pay for the ticket, and he put his hand in the bag to get his money out and got bitten. Oh. <laughs> yeah. But carried on as normal as if nothing had happened. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I just thought I'd mention I loved the pit. Like, it was just something more captivating about it. Like, you see people go to the reptile house at the Adelaide Zoo and they almost zoom through. Like, they look through the glass, there's a snake. Yeah. Look through the glass, can't see that one, must be sleeping. You know, and, and it's they're in and out. Um, yeah. There's something c- compelling about And San Diego Zoo has some displays like that where you have multiple animals and some of the other zoos as well, but San Diego Zoo has some of that type of stuff where you have multiple things. So you might have, I don't know if you know what a shelp sick is, but I don't oh, know what? if they've even pronounced it right. They sometimes call them glass snakes. It's a really oh, big okay. legless lizard, and that's another thing that you do get on the Greek islands. Very, so. very ugly. Uh, it's a very beautiful. <laughs> it's a very well, beautiful really animal. <laughs> but that fact, big. Uh, when I was on, I spent a lot of time on an island called Cos, and they must have been very, very common there, but I never managed to find any live ones. I only found dead ones. And uh, they're a bit like shinglebacks, you know, when they die, they, they hang around, the body hangs around for a long while. But these things are like, uh, their face looks very similar to a blue-tongued lizard's face, I thought. Yeah. Um, Are they the ones they used in the Indiana Jones Raiders of the Lost Ark movie, where he falls in, here we go. He falls into the pit of snakes, and you now he hates snakes. And it's like the one where they're looking for the ark, they're in I Egypt. Think, I think they do. Yeah. They might have some in there, I can't yeah. remember. Because there's all these snakes, but in fact they're legless scissors. There's some big giant yeah. legless scissors with a head like a blue tongue. And if I you're think, watching that movie, you, I think they did, yeah. you I see ear right. holes in these mm. snakes. Yeah. Supposedly. yeah. Well, London Zoo snakes. used to breed them on, on the roof. They used to have loads of outdoor enclosures. Um, oh, yeah. And they, there used to be just loads of them out there, and we used to go and... Ugly as... Well, I don't think they're ugly at all. Oh. 
But... Wow, John. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the first one I saw of those was actually in Taronga Park Zoo. So they used to have them years ago. I don't know if they still have them. Yeah. But uh, very large, as they very large, like, and they're not related to our local they local are large. They're no. a different family, mm. you know. Um, are they geckos? No, 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 no. Okay. no. They're something else. They're, they're their own family. We think of things as being, uh, yeah, like skinks, geckos, monitors, dragons, and wherever the snakes are. Um, but once you get overseas, you get a lot of other stuff. You know, there's a lot of other families that we don't even aren't even aware of here. You know. Um, we had no chameleons, for example, and igua- uh, iguanas and whatever, but there's quite a lot of different stuff over there. And the legless lizards, like this, these, I think they're in the same family as the slow worm, which is the one you get in England. Mm. Mate, you've been into this for a long time. You, are you losing interest, or is there always something new to keep you interested in? No, I'm, I am... Um, I uh, I mean, I've got this new opportunity. Like, I've spent... I used to have a very big collection. I used to spend a lot of time looking after my animals. But because um, uh, I've had to change my lifestyle, <laughs> uh, run into it, I, I used to actually have a lot of money. <laughs> and um, I've... My situation has changed. Now, I've had to cut my collection right down. And... Uh, what I'm doing is, with my partner, we're doing house sitting. We do it all around Australia, and we look after people's pets. And it's almost continuous. So we might spend anything from a few days uh, up to probably a maximum of about two months uh, doing house sitting. And we've done it in places like Perth. We've done it in several places in Victoria, New South Wales, and Queensland. So we're... Every time we go to these places, we explore all the national parks. We're seeing, besides seeing spectacular scenery and interesting places we haven't seen before, we're also seeing a lot of reptiles that we wouldn't normally see. And um, it's very exciting to see some of these snakes, which I haven't seen alive since I was a teenager, you know, that used to be wild caught, but you just do not see them in the pet trade. So something like a small-eyed snake or a marsh snake... Um, or even a copper tail skink, you know, um, which in the eastern states is a very common lizard, but a very beautiful lizard. But I mean, they used to, there's as far as I know, there's probably none in captivity in South Australia. Yeah, so I've it's very exciting exploring these areas, you know. Um, what would you say to uh, someone listening? Um, they may want to like you know get involved and get out there and go herping that kind of thing. You got any advice for a when you say going what like in the field? Yeah, yeah. on the field. Yeah. yeah. So um, I normally would not handle stuff uh, in the field unless uh, there's good reason. Whereas a lot of people that are, a lot of these photos that you see online, a lot of the good photos are where people perhaps work in museums or that they catch things and take them home and photograph and then take them back and release them. So I don't take things home, photograph and release them. I, phone, I photograph them in the, where they are, especially, particularly in national parks, because if you're in a national park, you don't want to be disturbing anything, really. But uh, what I would say is if you are... If you're turning over rubbish or whatever you turn over, because rubbish is actually quite often better to find reptiles under than, say, rocks. But if you, whatever you do, put it back where you find it and then also make it look as if it hasn't been disturbed. Uh, there is a place in America, it's called Snake Road. It's on my wish list. Now, I don't know whether America will actually let me back into the country again, <laughs> uh, but um, this place is called Snake Road, and it's on my wish list, and it's right in the middle of America. It's got some incredible number of reptiles there, and they close the road off uh, now. There used to be a place where people used to go to kill snakes, but they've closed the road off now, and you can go in there, and they do actually allow you to disturb the animals uh, so but you're not allowed to use any snake equipment so you can't use snake hooks or anything like that you can only use sticks and things like that but you can move them around to photograph them and pick them up to photograph them or whatever you want to do but in Australia the laws are quite tough in comparison so um, you have to be a bit careful about what you're doing you know with the wildlife and that you're not 
destroying anything or disturbing anything very much. I use a, an SLR, digital SLR, and I also use a iPhone. When you're using an SLR, it's much harder to get close to an animal to photograph it. But if you've got an iPhone, you can get a um, picture, which is probably just as good as the SLR, uh, without, quite often without catching the animal. You can just get the, cam- the iPhone close to the camera, to the lizard, and uh, take some really good photos. So um, catching them and then taking an SLR picture, picture is probably not a good idea, especially if you're not working for a museum or you're not doing any research or anything like that. And so. most people with the phones nowadays, they're, they're amazing cameras on them, so yeah, it is good. Yeah, certainly I found, and the more practice you get using them, and, and the more, if you to go onto YouTube and you figure out how you can actually change things and edit the pictures after, you can get some incredible pictures. I've just been taking some pictures of some of the reptiles that are here. Um, but well, I think it's good. I think anything that gets people out looking at nature and then appreciating the environment, anything that especially young people gets them out um, taking an interest, that's going to make them want to preserve and protect these areas, you know. Yeah, yeah and if you go to places like um, picnic areas or even theme parks um, quite often the animals that you see there are much more docile and you can get up close to them and take pictures and uh, a lot of the time it's just patience you can still get really good pictures without like getting a crowbar and you know getting into a crevice to get a Cunningham skink if you're patient or you can sometimes lure them out with some food um, or even just throwing um a small pebble or a flower towards them they'll quite often come out and investigate so you can get some, a lot of pictures with little tricks like that and you made a point earlier too you, you you spend hours walking through the bush you come back and you stop at the car have a drink and then suddenly there's an animal you didn't see on the walk you yeah so lace monitors in particular like to hang around picnic areas so um there's that's one of the best places to look if you're in Queensland or New South Wales, there's things like water dragons. There are, if you ask locals where they see them, if the general public is seeing the animals, there's a good chance that you're going to see them as well. You can also, if you know a local herper, if you know anyone that uh, does a similar type of thing, if you can get them to perhaps go out with you, you know, they can quite often spot stuff and find stuff and they know where particular little areas where they can perhaps almost guaranteed to see stuff and obviously you've got to be careful of venomous snakes while you're in it about venomous snakes do not if you do not know well you shouldn't be handling probably any snakes but um i've uh when i've been in queensland um some of the tree snakes green tree snakes just for some reason i've handled them and the the first one that i handled uh was on a boardwalk and someone almost stepped on it so I just moved it off the ball walk. Another one was in, when I was doing a house sit, the snake was in the garden and the dog apparently killed reptiles. So I, I just moved that into the nearby scrub. Uh, in fact, there was two that I found while I was in that house. And then uh, there was another one I found that looked like, I wasn't sure it was alive or dead. I thought it had maybe had drowned and was just laying in, the, in a pond of water, but that was actually uh, still alive. I just took that out of the water and it crawled away, but... Normally you wouldn't need to handle these things uh, or you don't want to be handling these things. You, if You've got to know your snakes. Uh, you've got to know the difference between a uh, killback and a, um, a rough-scaled snake. You've got to know the difference between a diamond python and a broad-headed snake. You know, it, if you don't really know what you're doing, don't handle any snakes at all. It can be very dangerous so for example the kill snake the australian kill snake killback snake is totally harmless but the rough scaled snake is up there with tiger snakes as far as venom goes you don't want to be bitten by one of those and it's similar with a broad-headed snake they resemble a diamond python a small diamond python and the venom is extremely potent these are um, animals that the general public doesn't quite often know exist Legless lizards is another example. Well, yeah, legless lizards. Um, unfortunately, it's the other way around for those. It's usually the legless lizard that gets killed. <laughs> you know, but, I mean, generally, death from Australian snake bite is fairly low, even though a lot of people do get bitten. But no one is going to get killed by a legless lizard. But, um, 
or, kill, 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 kill <laughs> daily by you yeah. know the ones in Adelaide resemble a baby brown snake they mimic a baby brown snake so they are getting killed regularly it's a really unfortunate um, evolutionary thing they've evolved to look like a baby brown which can kill another animal and they're mimicking that and then humans come along and go oh it's a snake kill it (laughs) Backfired. And I could be wrong, uh, but I sort of think it might be a similar type of thing with the um, broad-headed snake. But in that that situation, the diamond python is is mimicking the broad-headed snake, a young diamond, yeah. <clears throat> and um, but of course, people see the broad-headed snake and think it is harmless. Well, you, people, you hear people say, oh, "I did a snake course, and I learned that if it's got a broad head, it's harmless." You also get this issue with people from overseas and snakes from overseas. So at, whereas our killback is totally non-venomous and a lot of its relatives are non-venomous, there are there are killbacks that are actually quite dangerous overseas. Not many of them, but there's one. There's one. Um, I think it's in Japan, and that one is not only venomous, well, classed as venomous, but it's also poisonous. And um, and that gets its poison, its toxins come from the toads that it eats, and it it it's, um, saves the vet the poison in its neck somewhere, <laughs> and has very uh, weak skin on its neck. So if an animal grabs it by its neck, it gets a mouthful of toad poison, basically. So but it's also the bite is is poisonous, mm. um, and. Um, there are other snakes like uh, oh, I'm trying to think what the name it ever is, but there's there are a lot of snakes that might resemble harmless snakes here, and it's worse probably if you're coming from say America to Australia because our venomous snakes look harmless to them. So uh, yeah, so it is actually quite dangerous if you're not familiar with the snakes, um, and there's lots of obscure snakes. So there's so many species of reptiles around the world. Um, you know, it's hard to know what you're seeing. So you need to really have experts if you're overseas. I actually found, when I was in Dubai, um, I've spent a lot of time, as I say, overseas, but I'd never found any vipers or adders ever. And I went to Dubai, and uh, I went out on one of the tours where you go up into the desert on a four-wheel drive through the dunes, and then you go to this, like, campsite, and they have a belly dancer there, and they have camel rides, and they have sand surfing, and they have quad bike ride and all this type of stuff at a feast so I went there and um, when I went to do like sand surfing which was pretty crummy um, I noticed that there were some reptile tracks so I thought oh I wonder if I come out after, you know, after dark there might be some reptiles so just before we had to leave I got my digital SLR and my torch and I went for a quick walk I only had a few minutes and I stumbled across a, a viper Granada and I, I thought, it's just sitting there curled up and didn't move at all. I got some beautiful pictures of this, but I didn't know what species it was. I'd been in Greece and the the vipers and the, uh, the adders they have over there are basically almost harmless by Australian standards. I looked at the first aid treatment for the one that you supposedly got on the island cause, and that one, they said, for first aid, uh, take aspirins. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, very different. So, when I was in Dubai, I had no idea what type of vipers or adders were there. So I took a picture of this snake. And the pictures, as I say, they come out fantastic. And when I got back to, to uh, Adelaide, I just happened to turn on a program about the 10 most dangerous snakes in the world. <laughs> and what I had photographed was a saw-scaled viper. And the saw-scaled viper is responsible for um, 20,000 deaths a year. Oh, wow. which makes our Australian snakes look fairly harmless. But a lot of it is because people are walking around barefooted in those countries. It has a wide distribution and they don't get antivenine. Or they don't get treatment. Mm. But apparently that's a pretty dangerous snake. Yeah, it's still a big number. Of Did people. you poke it? No, I didn't. I just took pictures of it. I had my torch, I think, in my mouth. <laughs> and my camera, <laughs> which I took the pictures, and I thought, oh, I'd be lucky if any of these pictures come out. And they came out crystal clear. Could have recorded the sound it made. <laughs> it didn't make any sound. It didn't even get upset. Really? No. Yeah. Well, I think I must have this natural thing where snakes aren't scared of me. I don't know. Mm. Are they vipers we saw in Malaysia? Uh, three, three tree vipers, like wagglers and things like that. They were they're awesome, aren't they? They, they kill you? Oh, they, they'll hurt you a lot. Okay. 
Mm. Yeah, they hurt you a lot. Wouldn't wouldn't kill you. Okay. But they'll hurt. Well, they might kill you. I'm not going <laughs> to say they won't kill you, Adrian. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, John, mate, thanks so much for coming on the show. Always love to catch up with you when you're in town. Great work with the website. I've, I've enjoyed it over the years. I've enjoyed following it. It's a great resource for anyone that wants to check it out. We're going to put a link to it on our website. Um, and, mate, you're a really approachable guy online as well because I know that the hobby has a, has a few twits in there, you know, a few people that... Really? People that, yeah. Mm. But you may not have noticed, Steve. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but, but you're a very approachable guy. You will help anyone. I, I see you on there a lot asking questions... Uh, as, as well as teaching people so always obviously learning new things like like all of us so very humble mate and i, I appreciate it and i'm sure Absolutely. a lot of people do mate so thanks so much for coming on thank you for your time john thanks for inviting me and guys thanks for listening <laughs>